The Arizona State Society is proud to sponsor this unique contribution to the oral history of our state. I can think of no people better qualified than Mo Udall and Barry Goldwater to help us with this task. Both the Udalls and the Goldwaters are authentic pioneer Arizonans. Their colorful families have built and shaped the Arizona that prospers today. Both were presidential candidates who through their honest and forthright campaigns have carved a lasting place in this nation's history. While they reside at opposite ends of the political spectrum, they do have a great deal in common. For example, I noted that Senator Goldwater, chairman of the Armed Services Committee, has a bumper sticker on his car with an American flag waving that says, I support the right to bear arms. Well, Mo Udall, chairman of the Interior Committee, similarly has a bumper sticker where his has a picture of Smokey the Bear and says, I support the right to arm bears. At this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening, a longtime member and officer of the Arizona State Society, and currently Director of Congressional Relations for NASA, Jack Murphy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to participate in this particular evening's activities because I've had the good fortune of knowing both of these gentlemen for a good many years. I first met Senator Goldwater in 1949 when he was a member of the city council in Phoenix and I had occasions to talk things over with uh, Mo Udall when he was uh, playing basketball for the University of Arizona. The thing that I think is interesting about these two gentlemen is the time they have spent not only in Arizona but for Arizona and doing the things that have made Arizona a great state that it is. I think one of the interesting things about it is that uh, they're able to joke about the differences between themselves. They've had uh, many things to think about together for the state and many positions of opposition that they've discussed on a national issue. I think one of the points that uh, has been made once, I think, by Mo was that <clears throat> he said that the ultimate conservative is the Goldwater conservative. That's the one who doesn't want to see anything happen for the first time. Besides a wealth of humor, these gentlemen uh, also sub share a wealth of history. Many people have uh, heard the stories that uh, they've been, or I hope will be telling tonight, because all I want to do is just get them started and uh, suggest that uh, one of them should tell the story about their grandfathers and how they uh, helped one another in the early days. Mose uh, indicates that it's Barry's story and Barry says, well, it's really Mo's story. So I'm going to let you two decide who tells the story of the grandfathers. I'll start out and let him finish. The, uh, the, the Mormons were great colonizers. After they settled parts of Utah in the 1860s, 1870s, they started moving out to California. They had colonies in Colorado and New Mexico. And they sent a large contingent down to Arizona, which was led, the, the group that founded St. John's, where I grew up, was led by my grandfather, David K. Udall, and his uh, first assistant, incidentally, was Miles Romney, who was the grandfather of George Romney, who ran for president. But in any event, the Mormons were being persecuted. One of the great uh, issues in Congress, you go back and read the record in the 1880s, 1890s, they were complaining about these Mormons who were practicing polygamy, and uh, there were great criticisms made, and uh, they decided to prosecute some of the leaders. So my grandfather, David Udall, was thrown in jail at the Prescott uh, Territorial Jail awaiting trial on charges of polygamy, relating to polygamy. And a local merchant uh, in that city uh, who respected the Mormons and thought they were energetic and industrial folks, industrious people, uh, uh, took pity on him and signed his bail bond so he could go home and uh, go home and take care of his family awaiting trial. And the merchant's name was Baron Goldwater. Is that your grandfather, Mike. Bear? Mike. Mike. Barry told this story one night here in Washington, and I said, well, that's fine, what, but what the hell have you done for your generation? When Haldeman and Ehrlichman were in trouble, you didn't bail them out. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, uh, the, the story that I always heard was that uh, my old grandfather, who was the mayor of Prescott at that time, uh, got a horse, got the key to the jail from the sheriff, and went down that night and got Mr. Udall out of the jail and put him on the horse and said, get the hell out of town and don't come back. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, 
you can't win. You can't win. I always tell, I get back at Barry with some of the stories. You know, Barry's a father and grandfather, I guess. Is this the peddler that Everett Dirksen yeah. talked about when yeah. he nominated you? Mm -hmm. We're great merchants, but uh, Barry's father married a beautiful young woman who came west, and she was an Episcopalian. And most people assume somehow that the Goldwaters were Jews, and his father was, but uh, the kids, Barry uh, and his brother and the other in the family, were raised as Episcopalians. And Harry Golden in 1964, when it was obvious that Barry was going to be nominated, said, somehow I always knew that our first Jewish president would be an Episcopalian. <laughs> Then, then Barry, Barry's got to tell you the golf story. It was either him or his brother who went to play golf. Give him that one. Which one? <laughs> that nine holes. Oh, that one. Well, that was very funny. Uh, my brother plays a lot of golf with Bob Hope. And this was right after the war, World War II. And they went up to play golf on a, at a place called Irving on the Hudson. And Bob signed his name and the pro said, I'm sorry, Mr. Goldwater, but... Uh, you can't play here. This uh, is for Gentiles only. Bob said, well, can I play nine holes? I'm only half Jew. <laughs> uh, I, you know, <laughs> people always thought, "My, your brother must be the smartest thing around to think of something <laughs> like that. So I asked uh, an old fellow who was on a radio show years ago, can you top that? You know, he knew all the jokes. And I told him this joke, and I, you know, he maintained there was only seven basic jokes. Well, I said, Do you, have you ever heard this one before? And I told him that. And he said, yeah, that was used back when they were building the Temple of Solomon. And the Gentiles would come over and wear an apron and said, I'm half Jew, can I get a job? <laughs> I used to, I want to get off this subject, but I used to follow on with Sammy Davis Jr., the comedian who joined the Jewish faith and married this Swedish actress and was involved in an accident and lost his eye. And he goes to the golf course and he said, Sammy, what's your handicap? He said, handicap, man, I'm a one-eyed Negro Jew. <laughs> and I used to follow by saying in Arizona, I'm a one-eyed Mormon Democrat and I don't need, <laughs> I don't need any additional handicaps. Well, get down to something serious. Uh, I guess I've known Mo uh, most of his life. I used to when I was a lot younger, he, this was before World War II, to drive my car up there, fly an airplane up to St. John's and show the, the first the grammar school, then the high school, moving pictures of the Grand Canyon. And, and that's where I met uh, Moe's father and mother. And I'll never forget one night in her home for dinner, a good deal later when I was campaigning for Howard Pyle. And she looked at me and she said, young man, you're never going any place as a Republican. <laughs> and I thought she was right. <laughs> and there's times I think she was. <laughs> well, you know, I think a lot of newcomers to Arizona don't realize our political history, but we were essentially a one-party democratic state for years and years. And this guy came along in 1952. After the war, people were starting to move west to Arizona. Folks like John Rhodes and Betty came out from Kansas and settle down in Mesa and places. But uh, to get anywhere in politics, you had to be a Democrat almost for That's years right. and years and decades. But by about 1952, it all came together. And uh, there was a, Barry had helped Howard Powell run for governor two years earlier and busted that rule that Republicans couldn't be governor in Arizona. And two years later, he got the crazy idea of running against the majority leader of the United States Senate, Ernest McFarland. And he was trying to recruit a ticket so he'd be a little bit stronger and uh, have some company in this uh, uphill crazy thing he was doing. They called Mesa, and there's a young lawyer there named John Rhodes. And he said, John, why don't you run for Congress? And I heard John tell this story, and I'll probably botch it. But John said, hell, I don't want to go to Congress. And Barry said, don't worry, you won't. <laughs> No, I, but, uh, but he did, and he, he defeated a Democrat who was chairman of the Interior Committee. <laughs> it's a terrible thing to do. Well, we were, we were both very lucky. Uh, there was a fellow, fellow on that ticket with us. Uh, the name keeps slipping me as... Oh, Eisenhower. Eisenhower. Yeah. <laughs> and he added quite a bit to the ticket. 
Uh, John and John and I would never have been elected because I had no business ever beating Ernest McFarlane, and I, I knew that from the day I started. But uh, old Mac just thought he had it in the bag and didn't come home. You know, you're talking about Arizona being a democratic state. I, I think it's very interesting is the, the history of the territory, the background of it. We were actually uh, a Confederate state before we were a territory of the Union. I, a Confederate territory before we belonged to the Union. And we had uh, supposedly three Civil War battles in the state. Uh, one, they say, was held in my grandfather's saloon over in Ehrenberg, but I think it was just a couple of fellows having fun. And then uh, when the uh, uh, Mormon battalion was coming over, the Pima Indians jumped them one night, and that was a little bit of a fight. Then the big fight down at Picacho, Picacho Pass on the way to Tucson, in which I think two people were killed and a couple were wounded. So our early settlers all came from the South, and they were all very, very conservative Democrats. Uh, so the state actually never even, I don't think they had Republicans in there to, after we became a state, and then they were hard to find. I, Lord, that first time I ran for public office, I remember going to Greenlee County. <laughs> we had 10 Republicans. The whole county. The whole county. <laughs> and by God, I finally carried that county. <laughs> no, I think this, uh, I would only add this footnote that the Arizona Democrats, we used to call them Pinto Democrats, but they were more like uh, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, Alabama kind of Democrats. Uh, they were they were moderate to conservative kind of Democrats. And these were the people that started registering Republican in the late 50s and 60s. And now they finally caught up with us and passed us. There are more Republicans in Arizona than there are uh, Democrats now. A few more. Yeah. <clears throat> I, was in, I, I was in Minnesota once not with Hubert Humphrey. And I said, uh, Hubert, I said 20 years ago, Minnesota was one party Republican and we were one party Democrat, and now it switched around. Uh, this was true at the time I was there. I said, I didn't know until tonight what had caused this. As I went through the audience at the reception, they were saying, do you know my Aunt Minnie in Scottsdale, or have you met Uncle George, who retired in Yuma? And when I got up to speak, I said, thanks a hell of a lot. I now understand why we're one party Republican and you're one party Democrat. You sent us all the Republicans in the state. Well, he mentioned the word Pinto, and of course, Pinto means paint, and they referred to the Democrat jackass, or even him a horse, and they call him a Pinto. It means he's paint, he's part brown, part white, and so he's part Republican, part uh, Democrat. But the, as Mo said, uh, our Democrats out there were very, very conservative. And you know the funny thing is, the old ones still are. I, I could never have been elected. Uh, if it hadn't been for Democrats, I'd still be back selling pants. It's probably... <laughs> Maybe the country had been better off. I think it was. <laughs> I don't mean that. I don't mean that seriously. No, I think one of the best things Mo ever said was, between Goldwater and Udall, they uh, uh, switched, they made, uh, made it wrong to say, Every mother's son has a chance to be president. Except in Arizona. Except that was at the press club after I'd, I said, Barry Goldwater lost to Lyndon Johnson by 17 million votes. Johnson promptly adopted his foreign policy, but I, I said he lost, to, he lost to Johnson by 17 million votes, and I came in 14 times second to Jimmy Carter. Between us, we've made Arizona the only state in the Union where mothers don't dare to tell little kids they can grow up and be president. <laughs> that was it. Well, Barry, your uh, grandfather, wasn't it, uh, sort of established the Democratic Party in the state of Arizona, didn't he? My uncle. Who's uh, your uncle? My uncle was head of the, well, he was one of the founders of the Founding Democratic Party. Founding father. Well, he wasn't the only one. There was a bunch of them. I think they met in the palace bar one night and started the party. <laughs> but he was the vice president of the Constitutional Convention, and old uh, George W. P. Hunt was the president. I have a book someplace, The Legislative History of Arizona by Kelly. You had that. Mm -hmm. And in it, it tells of uh, Vice President Morris Goldwater offering, as he was writing up the daily proceedings, uh, for 50 cents he would write laughter, 
and 75 cents applause. <laughs> I don't think and, a, and, a, and a dollar member standing cheering or something like that. <laughs> now we were talking earlier. There was one time five U dolls who were judges in the state of Arizona. Can you imagine that? Five U dolls. <laughs> and I couldn't even get a parking ticket fixed. <laughs> No, his father was Chief Justice, and they went from there right on down the line. Well, Jesse, Jesse was, well, at one time we had the Supreme Court and 14 Superior Courts, and we had Udalls in four of the 14 Superior Courts. Uh, Don Udall was judge at Holbrook. Uh, Jesse Udall was judge at Safford. Nick Udall was judge at Superior Court in Phoenix, and my father was on the Supreme Court. I remember uh, Somebody, Dick Chambers, who was federal judge, Barry appointed him federal judge, he went over to Safford, a Mormon community, to try a case. And he said he knew, uh, well, this was a bribery case against the attorney general, whose lawyers, they had moved it to Graham County. Well, John Sullivan was charged with bribery. And the judge was Ben Blake, who was head of the church, the stake president, and the prosecutor was Chester Peterson, who was county attorney both prominent Mormons, and they were picking the jury, and at noon the judge said, the congregation will remain seated until the jury has had an opportunity to pass out. <laughs> he said, I knew we'd been had. <laughs> and Chambers tells the story about uh, going over there to try a lawsuit in that same court in the same situation, and everybody was Mormon on the jury, a uh, judge was Mormon, the other lawyer was Mormon, and uh, his client was named Johnson, and he said the they asked the question, now, Brother so-and-so, were you there with Sister so-and-so when Brother so-and-so said something in the presence of Mr. Johnson? <laughs> His client, and he said, I, I got the brother treatment and I never went back. <laughs> well, politics have changed out there quite a bit. State's getting big. I was home this last weekend for two days, and I'll swear every time I go home, I don't know the place. You haven't heard the latest one, I don't think. Some jackass wants to build a 102-story building. 104? 114. 114. Well, that's just a little too high for the airplanes. <laughs> and he might get away with it. Well, let's hope not. Hmm? I liked Arizona when it was small and a lot of space. I did, too. Which... Well, when you all were first uh, had occasions to uh, campaign for office, uh, around the state. Mo had everything uh, to campaign in except the, I guess, Maricopa County or the city of Phoenix. When I became congressman, we had two districts. John Rhodes was, had Maricopa County and I had everything else. <laughs> I remember some idiot had stationed me. I had a little airplane, but I copied Barry. The smartest thing he ever did was to bring aviation to Arizona politics, flying Howard Powell around, but some idiot had scheduled me for breakfast in Douglas, lunch meeting in Page, and dinner in Yuma. Oh my. <laughs> In a single-engine Piper plane, it was like going Boston to Pittsburgh to yeah. Richmond for one day's work. Do you have any war stories or flying stories that you'd like to tell these folks, Barry? No. You were saying once that you'd flown a, uh, one of his relatives around the state at one time. Oh, I remember once when the, the Udalls have a great, wonderful habit of getting together. I don't know if you still do that, but uh, at this particular meeting in St. John's, there were over 210 Udalls. And I served, I was the vice mayor of Phoenix, and Nicholas, Moe's cousin, was the mayor. And his father, John, had been the mayor of Phoenix. You know, we don't get any place without you damn Udalls. <laughs> well, John, just to interrupt one second, John was a Republican. Yeah. <laughs> and Damner became governor back in the 20s uh, That's with right. Herbert Hoover was elected president, and uh, Nick, his son, was a Democrat, who be later became, they were both mayor of Phoenix, about 20 years apart. Well, we were, I flew them up to St. John's for the family reunion, and that's the first time John had ever been in an airplane. And, you know, you go up over that rim, and you want to have a lot of air down below you, because if anything happens, there's nothing down there but trees. And John kept saying, go lower. We're too high. Get lower. And I was finally down there with us doing this to get through the trees. <laughs> finally got John up there. He was happier than a bird. My favorite flying story, I think, uh, for 25 years I owned this little plane and flew all over Arizona. 
one of the Babbitt boys, they're as bad as the Goldwaters and you know in terms of hogging offices and public attention. But uh, John Babbitt, who was one of the younger lawyers, was going to Tucson, and uh, I was, had completed my meeting and was going to Tucson. I said, come on, ride with me. I got a seat open, a little one-engine plane with a single-engine plane with a one-eyed pilot. I'd lost this eye as a kid. I have been, some here don't know it, but I've been referring to it. Anyway, uh, I offered him a ride. I had this one eye covered with a patch, and I said, go to Tucson with a one-eyed pilot in a single-engine airplane. He said, I never ride in single-engine airplanes with one-eyed pilots on account of my back. I said, I didn't know you had an injury. He said, it isn't that. There's a yellow stripe down the middle. <laughs> I remember taking off one night at Yuma. Barry had been warming up the Republicans, and I had been extolling the virtues to the Democrats, and Tower cleared his little twin bonanza or whatever he had, and I was about three minutes behind, and we had a little conversation on the radio. He was going back to Phoenix, and I was on my way to Tucson, but he made, uh, he brought flying into Arizona politics, and it was never the same after that, Barry. Was that? Arizona politics was never the same after you introduced no, flying. No, no, I got, that, I think that's got Howard Powell elected. We flew uh, about 20,000 miles all over that state. I've been, uh, making little marks on a map of every place I've ever landed an airplane. And I'm over 200 now, and some of them are just little wide spots in the road, but that's the beauty about those little airplanes. You see a farmhouse down there, you go down and stop and see if he wants to vote for you. If he does, you... <laughs> if he does, you leave him some literature. If he doesn't, you leave him $5 and hope you're right. <laughs> It always worked in West Virginia. <laughs> One of the things we've talked a lot about the, the state, uh, talk for a moment about some of the national issues that have uh, come along. John Kennedy played a rather dramatic uh, part in each of your lives. It uh, opened up an opportunity for Mo to get into the Congress by the appointment of uh, Stewart to the Secretary of Interior position. And it gave you a strong reason after having known, his, known him well in the Senate to uh, challenge him for the, plan to challenge him for the presidency. What about uh, your relationship with John Kennedy? I didn't know him all that well. It's like Kennedy used to say when uh, he'd go campaign, every little town in Iowa he went to, there'd be six guys who were on PT-109. And he said that apparently had a crew of 21,800. <laughs> I, w I worked with Teddy. Teddy had the Rocky Mountains for his brother. With the Kennedy family, you get out and take assignments in the campaign. And he was in his 20s, I guess, then, and stayed at my house a time or two and was back and forth in the Rocky Mountain states. We didn't do very well out there, as I recall. But uh, I got to know Jack Kennedy a little bit during the campaign. He went to Yuma. Stu had the bright idea of the candidates always come to Phoenix and nobody remembers it, but they still talk about Yuma, Stu bringing John Kennedy to, to Yuma, and that was his Arizona appearance. But I got to know him uh, a little bit better uh, when I got back here. I remember having stars in my eyes. I was at the uh, Jack Kennedy in the evening. Uh, you'd sit out in the portico at about this time of year, and he'd invite six or eight congressmen down to get acquainted and talk strategy and issues and so on. I remember I'd been in Washington about two weeks, and here I am sipping drinks on the portico of the White House with John Kennedy. Uh, well, Barry, you can tell about Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> he's, he's my authority, except I remember when you and Lyndon eulogized Carl Hayden there in the Gamage Auditorium at Tempe at, when Carl Hayden died. That was oh, an yeah, impressive was... occasion. Well, uh... Hey, we were both lucky to have served, and John was too, with Carl Hayden. Yeah. There'll never be another one like him. He, I was old enough to remember, but I didn't. And he was sheriff of Maricopa County. And he refereed a baseball game in which old Leverett Saltonstall played. <laughs> Leverett went to the Judson School, you yeah. know? Yeah. But uh, Hayden, someone was asking me about him the other day. I, I, you never heard from him, he never said much, and he always had that famous expression, he was a workhorse, not a show horse. 
But uh, I've often said that there's no how to say this in front of more. We may not like it. Uh, we've been doggone fortunate, uh, we Arizonans, uh, excluding me. I'm not talking about me, but uh, we've you learn, had... You, you learn to be humble with Lyndon uh, tonight, Johnson's Tonight, can I be humble? All right. <laughs> then I won't, I won't talk, say, the, say the things I thought I was going to. But we've had Carl Hayden, uh, chairman of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, we've had John Rhodes back here. Well, I know what it was all about. Somebody wanted to know today uh, about the Central Arizona Project. And that's where your name came up. And of course, we had Mo as chairman of the Interior Committee in the House, and all you need is a license to steal. <laughs> and it all looks good and sounds good. But Arizona, I hope someday somebody will sit down and write a book uh, going way back to the 1850s and 60s of the people from Arizona that had uh, a little say-so back here. Ernest McFarland we talked about Ernest earlier. Ernest McFarland, uh, whom I should never have beat. In fact, I'll never forget. I came back here one day on Central Arizona Project business, and uh, Mac had just been made a leader, majority leader of the Senate. And I said, Mac, you're out of your head. I said, you cannot carry that Truman. He's going to be too heavy an anvil around your neck. Someone's going to beat you. And uh, never dreaming for one minute that I would be the guy to try it. Because I used to go out and raise money for him. I liked him so much. And, <laughs> well, that's uh, where it went. And old Henry Fountain Ashurst. You remember him, don't you? Oh, yes. He, he was he, a, I got a picture of him, and I'm on the steps of the Supreme Court over here with him. He made the motion to make me a member of the Supreme Court bar. And he was supposed to take about one minute to do it, or 30 seconds. They hand you a little card which says, Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court, I move the uh, admission of Johnson of Arizona. I'm satisfied that he has the necessary qualifications. Asher just wanted to make a speech. He's like Everett Dirksen. He never use two one-syllable words if you could get five four-syllable words to do the same <laughs> job. But we, uh, I want to tell Asher sto stories if we've got time here, but uh, well, Barry was serious for a minute. Let me add to what he said. Somebody asked me why it was that Arizona, a dinky little state with 1% of the nation's population, produced leaders like John Rhodes and Barry Goldwater and Ernest McFarland and Stu Udall and the others have been mentioned. And I said, seriously, I didn't know, but I thought it had something to do with the civilized kind of brand of politics. You go to some states and your opponent is automatically a thief and a crook and uh, there's little respect for the other side. And we had a, I've had a civilized relationship with Barry, you and John Rhodes and all the people we've mentioned. And I think it's, that's probably the explanation, if there is one, uh, uh, of why we've had more influence than, than others. Before we leave 64, Barry doesn't want to talk about 64, and I don't blame him. I don't want to talk about 76. <laughs> Although I, I ought to tell some Billy Carter and Jimmy Carter and St. John's and Plain stories. But Barry, uh, I think the other thing that made our state the way it is is that we can laugh together and laugh at each other and laugh at ourselves. This guy was the target of more damned humor in 1964 than anybody, and he handled it better than anybody. You remember the old story that uh, Barry was making a new movie with the, had the studios lined up, 18th Century Fox? Yeah. <laughs> that was old Hubert Humphrey. And then the other one I always remember is uh, he was supposed to be, you ask if he's elected and the Soviets uh, start a nuclear strike, what are you going to do? And he says, the first thing you do is get the wagons in a circle. That's right. <laughs> That was a lot of, that was fun. I'm, I bet you remember a lot about that yeah. campaign. I, uh, you know, it's been so darn long ago, 20 years ago. I've darn near forgotten about it. And, and uh, well, that's the only trouble now with, with me and politics in Arizona. Everybody's dead who remembers I ran. <laughs> and, well, uh, I hope I'll reach that situation well, soon. <laughs> I, I get tired of getting reminded of being beaten by Jimmy Carter. Well, uh, it's, that's not as bad as being beaten by Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> well, we're going to have a separate debate on that subject, too. <laughs> I always liked old uh, Jimmy. I, at least he was a religious man. <laughs> he, believed in, he believed in things, and he was honest. I haven't mentioned anything, but... 
<laughs> Careful. <laughs> Let me get one more 64 thing in here. <laughs> well, Barry, uh, Barry would have been uh, probably one of the two or three senior people in town here and would have been chairman of the Armed Services Committee, except he ran for president. And we had this crazy rule that seniority has got to be continuous. If I'm here 20 years and I have to get out for a week for some important reason, I come back a freshman the next week. And Barry, in 1964, uh, no, in 1960, he had gone through Texas. Nick, uh, Kennedy had picked Richard Nixon. No, no. I mean, Kennedy had picked Lyndon Johnson as his vice presidential candidate. And uh, bad luck, Johnson had turned out that Johnson's term was up that year. So uh, it didn't look too promising. He was willing to run for vice president, but he wasn't sure they were going to win. <laughs> and so he got the Texas legislature to change the law, and uh, he could run for uh, vice president and for the Senate at the same time. And Barry went all through Texas. He was a real hot drawing card down there, and I guess still is. But he was denouncing Johnson for running uh, for two things. Why doesn't he run for sheriff and some other things at the same time? So four years later, Barry's in the situation of having a presidential nomination, and his term was up. And he was as good as his word. He didn't say, do as I say, do as I do. He did as he had been saying in 1960, and therefore caused a break in his seniority, which... Uh, you got four years, two years? Four years. Four That's years. Nice long leave. Just an ordinary <laughs> taxpayer, a humble taxpayer for four years. Well, I, I used to call that the Johnson ticket, and I thought it was a hell of an idea. Uh, you ran for everything on the ticket. <laughs> everything. <laughs> then, now you weren't going to win them all, but you won four or five. Yeah. <laughs> Then you look around, you well, you know, you, you do a little horse trading. I'd say, Mo, uh, hey, you want to be sheriff? Well, if you want to be sheriff, uh, all right, I want to be a congressman. And we'd make a deal. But we never could get that over in Arizona. They, <laughs> they wouldn't buy it. No, that, now, Johnson, uh, I had a lot of fun with him on it, but it didn't get him any place or get me any place either. I want to go back to St. John's for a minute. Uh... You know, uh, the first time I saw Barry, I think, was when he flew in with Howard Pyle. St. John's International Airport was a dirt strip. <laughs> Hell, we'd never seen an airplane up there until he flew in. But uh, I used to kid Jimmy Carter saying, you think Plains, Georgia is small? I said, St. John's, Arizona, where I grew up, was so small you couldn't even lust in your heart. <laughs> And then, Barry, you get all the small towns. The guy said my, his town was so small, he thought until he got out of high school that the name of the town was Resume Speed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we used to kid, when Barry came to St. John and made his first speech, they said he was the only man, the only candidate in Arizona history who could get God, Mother, Flag, Fourth of July. There's one other I missed, all in the same... Uh, all in the same sentence. He'd say, you know, I always remember when I was a little kid, my mother take us down to the courthouse on the 4th of July to raise, see him raise the flag <laughs> and stop for apple pie on the way home. Probably. <laughs> well, that was sort of true. But uh, I was just trying to think about some of the old things that used to happen out in that state. And, uh, well, Prescott has a very... Uh, important place in your life. Well, Prescott was, I always called Prescott my home, even though I wasn't born up there. My sister was born there, but my family moved up there after having gone broke in Phoenix in 1870. We went broke in more damn places than you can shake a stick at. <laughs> we went broke in some places you'd ever heard of. <laughs> and uh, went up to Prescott and uh, started a little store up there, and my grandfather hauled supplies to the army posts. And one day my father decided he'd want to go back to Phoenix. But my uncle said, no, Phoenix will never amount to anything. All they're going to have down there is farming, and up here we've got the mines. Well, they argued, and they finally, to settle it, played a game of casino. And my father won. And in 1894, we moved back down to Phoenix, and uh, eventually we made a little money. 
Selling underwear. To... <laughs> Selling underwear. Yeah, that was one of the... I was thinking about that today. I made, I made men's white shorts <laughs> with big red <laughs> ants on them. <laughs> and I called them antsy pants. <laughs> and I just figured uh, there wasn't a woman in the world that didn't know at least one man that she'd like to send a pair of ANSI pants to. <laughs> and then I sent six pair to Harry Truman. <laughs> and that, that got him started. My God, we, we almost went broke selling ANSI pants. <laughs> this was one of his great contributions to America, I think. <laughs> oh, it was our, our contribution to art. <laughs> Oh, that was one of his days when he was an undercover man. Oh, all right. no. Oh. no, no wonder NASA's having trouble. <laughs> you know, they've got a new one now uh, over at NASA. All of you have heard about a pilot that he, he pulls two Gs or three or four Gs. That's three times or four times the force of gravity. And now they have a new uh, determiner for sickness. You've got a two garn, three garn, <laughs> five garn. <laughs> He's another Mormon boy, did pretty good. Yeah, he did fine. Yeah. Barry, we've got to tell war stories before we're through here. You flew the hump. Yep. China, Burma. China, Burma, India. What, you flying the old C-47? C-46, and the, oh, I was the first one to fly the C-54. But we went over the lower hump, down around Mission now. Uh, it, that airplane wouldn't go high enough to get over the northern hump. <laughs> yeah, that was fun up there. There was no radio aids. There was nothing. We had that little old transport outfit. Incredible story. The Japanese had cut off China and Burma, had run still well out of China. That's right. The only way to get supplies were these a few pilots would fly these crazy little old airplanes up through this pass. What, 20,000 feet or so? 22, if you could get there. <laughs> oh, I had some wonderful stuff in the back of my airplane time to time. I, I took a Buick automobile over for Mrs. Shang Kai-shek. I took a whole lot of toiletries and dresses for Mrs. Shang Kai-shek. <laughs> And one, the last trip I made, I had $40 million of Chinese paper money in the back end and 13 barrels of gold, about that big around, about that high. And all the way over, my crew would keep looking at the map. They'd say, uh, Major, let's push that gold out. One of us will jump. <laughs> and every time they come over, just drop some food. When the, war, <laughs> when the war's over, come pick us up. I said, no way. No, that was a lot of fun over there. Yeah. I was, you had some time in the, in the service, you were didn't in you? South well? Pacific. Four years in the Air World Force? War II. I was Air on Corps? the U.S. side, in case there's any doubt here. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to... Uh, the war came along, and that was a popular war. I was, I was at the university as a sophomore, Sunday afternoon, Pearl Harbor. The next day, I'm down trying to, uh, to enlist in the Army, in the Air Force, the Navy. Nobody wants me. I got a glass eye. But I was in ROTC, and they had a special deal that you could continue your ROTC, and uh, two years later, you'd be commissioned a second lieutenant, and you'd also have your degree from the university. So I thought, hey, man, that's a hell of a deal. Uh, that's the way I'm going to get in and help my country. So I took the eye test for ROTC. They said, cover your right eye, and I did like this. They said, cover your left eye, and I did like this. And I, <laughs> it's an old trick nobody would heard of, but I was uh, all set with the ROTC, except one guy had been washed out for flat feet and complained to the colonel that they were taking one-eyed guys and he couldn't go with flat feet. And they gave me another eye test. <laughs> which they, they held the hand over the eye. And, but anyway, I figured I'm a 4F, I'm going to stay home, and I can't be in this great war, and uh, 90 days later, they draft me. The, <laughs> it just madder than hell. There was a gap in the law. You couldn't, be, you couldn't enlist, but you could be drafted. And so they sent me off to a special service, limited service. They did, didn't want us guys in combat, but they figured we could type and uh, intelligence stuff and administration. So I spent four years, ended up a captain in the uh, 
in the uh, old Army Air Force and went out to Iwo Jima and Guam and Saipan. I landed on Iwo Jima at a D plus 100. <laughs> the war was all over and I landed with a piano and some baseball equipment to entertain the troops <laughs> till we could get them home. But uh, it was a, I showed this conspicuous bravery under fire. <laughs> Not the kind you'd think of, but those are my war stories or some of them. Let's talk about some legislation that you've been involved in over the years. Uh, one uh, subject that uh, has always been interesting with the, uh, is the Indians and the very important role that they've played in both your lives. You lived on the reservation, on the Navajo Reservation. A youngster, didn't you, Barry? Oh, well, I've lived with most all the Indians. They, they call me Sis Chali, which means curly hair. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago. No, uh, there's not, a, <clears throat> frankly, not enough Amer Arizonans that understand that we have almost a third of all the Indians in the United States living there. And, and now, you know, they're getting ready for a big one up at Big Mountain. Yeah. They've got the, uh, that wild-eyed bunch that aren't even Indians. They're stray whites from all over the country, and they, they're up there with their guns and their buses, and we have... Uh, former Secretary of the Interior going to make a decision on whether the Navajos move or the Hopis move. And they swear if they, uh, they bunch up their AMI or AIM, whatever they are. Oh, the AIM group? Yeah. American Indian Movement. American yeah. Indian group. Uh, that there are going to be some killings. And they said especially if Senator Goldwater introduces any legislation to make them move. Hmm. I'm gonna, if I introduce it, I'm going to move to Mexico real fast. <laughs> but we've, uh, Mo and I have been working on that most of our lives, and it's been going on over 100 years, and it isn't, it isn't very close to being settled yet. Well, but each of you played a major role in attempting to settle it in the... Uh, yeah, we, we tried. Now, twice, this has gone to court twice, two long lawsuits. One of them lasted about 15 years. The Congress has acted twice. The last time in 70, 1974, when Barry and I put together a compromise that we thought would fly. Uh, we, there's room for conciliation. There's room for deciding. The line's got to go somewhere. And some people are going to have to move. And the politicians, uh, both Indian and non-Indian, tend to go up there and stir them up every election year. Vote for me and you won't have to move. Or vote for me and we'll protect you. And this thing's got to be settled. You can't have war going on there. It's like the Middle East. But uh, Barry and I have worked together, and I think uh, if there's any friend of Indians in Arizona history, it's Barry Goldwater. Uh, they don't always appreciate him, but he's been their friend, and he's told them, told them the way it is. Well, I remember last year, uh, with Moe's big help, we got a, a wilderness bill through. And that's something I never thought I'd participate in. And if I lived to be 500, because I'll be honest with you, I don't have much use for wilderness. I want it to stay that way. <laughs> and the minute you create a wilderness area, then a lot of these Easterners have to have paved roads to get in, and they have to have hot dog stands and motels and the whole damn country's ruined. <laughs> but uh, Mo got through the Aravipi Canyon Bill, and uh, if you've never been there, you ought to go see it. What a gem. That's one place that I, man can never bother them. Man can't even get there. <laughs> <laughs> we talked earlier about civilized politics and decency. Uh, Barry, I didn't tell you this very much the day we were there. We dedicated Aravipa. They have kind of a system if your party's in power and they're going to dedicate something that's federal, the, uh, your party's congressmen and senators are there and they're featured and so on and it doesn't matter who did the work, uh, they're going to build up and display and show favoritism to the person in their party. And Democratic administration has done it as well. But I got there for the dedication and Barry was there and the program had me down for remarks and had Barry down for the dedication speech and they had the plaque which had his uh, name three or four times on it and he was to unveil the plaque and Barry got up and said, uh, hey, this is all wrong. We wouldn't have had this bill without Mo Udall. He said, you come on over here and help me get in the picture and uncover the plaque, and went on and on in that vein. And I said, uh, flying away, that guy's got real class. I couldn't think of too many people who would have done that. Oh, hell. 
Well, as I said earlier, without Mo in that job over there, and John can vouch for this because he had the same position over here, there's just a lot of things that would never have gotten done in Arizona that, uh, whether we like it or not, think that some of those things have to be done. And now we're in the last gasps of the Central Arizona project. And of course, uh, we've got a lot of Easterners back here that only trouble they come from states with too much water. And they come out there to Arizona and they don't realize it's so dry. I, well, I was home last, well, yesterday. I looked down the hill and there was a tree chasing a dog. <laughs> I don't find that very often. This thing is deteriorating, in this program. <laughs> I promised earlier, I got to, that reminds me, I've got to tell an Ashurst story. Ashurst was one of these guys who never used, <clears throat> he was a florid old style orator. As I said earlier, he never used uh, little words if he could use big ones. But he told on himself the maiden speech, he came here in this very building as a United States Senator in 1912 when Arizona was first admitted. He said he got up to make his maiden speech, he wanted to impress all the troops, and he said, oh, Mr. President, this great new baby state of Arizona just admitted to the Union is magnificent. This great new state, Mr. President, has every potential. This great new state, Mr. President, has the potential to become a veritable paradise. He said to become a veritable paradise, we need only two things. We need water and we need lots of good people. And an old senator from Mons said, if the gentleman will forgive me, that's all I need in hell. <laughs> bring up the name of old Henry Fountain. He never went to school in his life. He was a cowboy. And he could recite every word that Shakespeare ever wrote. And I remember him here with his black frock coat on, his striped pants, and a big red carnation. And every evening at five o'clock out at the Sheraton, he'd gather and there'd be a whole bunch of women. He was a good looking guy and he had women all around him. And he'd uh, recite Shakespeare. But uh, it was kind of difficult for him because he wasn't a lawyer. And the law firm that took care of my family's business was the old Ellenwood family. And old man Ellenwood said, uh, uh, Mr. Ashurst, if you'll go to the University of Michigan and get your law degree, uh, we'll take you in the office. So I went to Michigan for two weeks. and came back and <laughs> in those days, you remember, uh, all you had to be, uh, all you had to do to become a lawyer was to have another lawyer say you, he felt you were competent. And old man Ellen would say he felt he was competent, so Henry Fountain became a lawyer. He couldn't even spell it. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote, a, I wrote a book once, uh, 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 just a collection, collection of, of his speeches. His speeches, fourteen speeches, one for each county, and the best speech I think was ever made any place. There's one he made on the floor about old Huey Long, Russell's father. I just pulled it out yesterday. Yeah. I, I had to go to Russell and say, do you mind if I use this speech? He said, no. He said, you know, my father heard that speech and to his dying day, he thought well, that was the highest tribute that was ever paid. Yeah. And old Henry called him every kind of an SOB you could call him in, <laughs> in English. And it's something you all should read. That's was typical of this fellow Asher's. I, I, there have been some other great speakers here, but I've never heard anybody like Henry. You know, he'd write a speech, and then he'd keep writing it until he memorized yeah. it. Then he'd make that speech for a long time. In fact, <laughs> when, I, when I, put, I put these speeches together, I said, I'm at 14 of them. He says, but Barry, I've made over 5,000. <laughs> that closed that up. Well, he had a sense of humor and a pretty good storyteller as well. Oh, yeah. But he was not afraid to poke fun at himself. He was chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and Roosevelt decided that he wasn't getting very good decisions from the Supreme Court, so he wanted six more judges to have 15 instead of nine. Ashurst, a dutiful Democratic chairman, put in the darn bill and got it out of committee, and between there and the floor, they, it became a national eruption that he was trying to pack the Supreme Court. That's right. Asher took so much hell from heat from home, he, uh, he uh, turned around and led the fight to defeat his own bill. And he used to say he got this telegram from a lady in Phoenix saying, thank God for your courageous stand on that Supreme Court bill. He said, I wired back which one. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, he was a great one. Well, there's been other legislation that you all have been involved in over the years that have, have uh, brought some attention to, to yourselves. Legislation that you've worked on and so forth. Is there anything that stands out particularly in your mind that, uh, that you've... Well, Central Arizona Project is the obvious one, oh, yeah. but uh, the wilderness bill we talked about is important and... Uh... Well, we got back that uh, Zuni heaven yes. up north of St. Very, John. Barry gets tenacious. He, he wanted the Zuni's <laughs> sacred land back and we got it back. We got it back and uh, I'm now some sort of a, I don't know, a Zuni angel. <laughs> I don't know why they never do this for me. I don't I know. <laughs> Uh, I'm just a half Jew. They can bury me up there. <laughs> you can't. You're dead. All right. Before we leave this thing tonight, uh, you've got to get Barry talking about Glen Canyon and the Colorado River. As a young man, uh, I'd give anything to turn the time clock back and do what he did. I used to keep a register, he was telling me tonight, of the uh, people who went down the Colorado River. This is before Glen Canyon and uh, Lake Powell. And Barry was, what, 79 or something you said? I was the 70th one that ever did it back in 1940, and we went from Green River, Wyoming, to uh, Hoover Dam. And there's uh, almost no place to get out. You couldn't. Uh, once you started, you finished. But now, uh, I think last year, 16,000 people went down. And, of course, Glen Canyon, which is one of the most beautiful canyons in the world, I said earlier, People often say, in all the years you've been there, haven't you voted against something that you were sorry for? I said, yeah, Glen Canyon Dam. Uh, John down here fronting, uh, because it was the most, probably the most beautiful canyon in the whole world. It wasn't as big or as grand as the Grand Canyon, but the sheer red limestone cliffs coming down seven and 800 feet, and that muddy old Colorado River and then to go into the Colorado itself, and we were talking about Lee's Ferry and your connection, your family with that historic place. And that's a, quite a story, and I, I don't know, I don't, maybe I shouldn't even talk about it. Well, your grandfather, maternal grandfather, wasn't it? Uh, well, you have no? four, everybody has four great grandfathers, and I was up <laughs> last month uh, dedicating the whole Arizona wilderness system up there by the Vermilion Cliffs on the way to Kanab from Lee's Ferry. And I said, my four grandparents, great-grandparents, were deeply involved, each of them in different ways, in this Mormon move to colonize Arizona. John D. Lee was the, uh, started Lee's Ferry. When you go to Lee's Ferry, this is my great-grandfather. And uh, Jacob Hamlin, my other great-grandfather on my mother's side, was the original Mormon pioneer scout. He'd go down and scout places where the Mormons could make settlements. And the Indians learned to trust him. He was a friend of the Hopi and the Navajo Indians. And, on the other side was David K. Udall, who came down to start the town of St. John's that we talked about earlier. And uh, that was on my father's side. And my dad's mother was a steward. The stewards moved into Las Vegas and were business people down there. So I had uh, these drama of the settlement of Arizona in the latter part of the 19th century. I had four great-grandfathers all involved at different times. We had the dedication there, Barry, and. Uh, the uh, Mexicans who owned St. John's said they'd give it up and get out and let the Mormons have it for 800 head of cattle. So <laughs> my grandfather took a group of the young Mormons to Utah and they'd go to each community and have to give them three cows or four cows and then they drove this herd of 800 cows and got them across Lee's Ferry somehow up that gorge and out onto the plateau and up to Holbrook and Winslow and on up to St. John. What an incredible story. Well, the first time I went across that river up there, about 1924, we, we went across the old Lee's Ferry. Yeah. It took two days to drive up to Jacob's Lake from Flagstaff. I can believe it. But that's a, that's a beautiful part of Arizona, and not a lot of people go up there, but I think they should. The, old, the Pariah River comes in there, and there's a, this new issue of Arizona Highways has a very fine article in it about hiking in the Pariah beautiful country. You know, I remember Jacob Hamlin, I think, was the first Mormon that came into Tuba City. Yeah, I think that's right. He came across the old, <clears throat> called it the Crossing of the Fathers, mm -hmm. or Father Escalante. Trying to find a short, 
trying to find a shortcut to the California decided they were lost when they got to Utah and turned around and crossed the Colorado River and until the, the dam was built you could still see the steps that they chiseled in the rock and, and they how they knew that was a shallow spot I don't know but it was shallow enough at normal water that if you had the strength it was shallow enough for a man to walk over mm -hmm. but a, a horse or a mule had no trouble and that's the way his great-grandfather came into Tuba City, and that became quite a Mormon settlement for a long, long time. It was. Now that's, uh, my great-grandfather helped set it up and spent several winters there, several years down there. You know, I can't leave that area in the dams without just going on record. One thing, the uh, other thing Barry and I did together, the plan for Central Arizona Project originally had two big dams, one at Marble Canyon, which is just below Lee's Ferry, a few miles we're talking about, and the other at Bridge Canyon, or Hualapai, later known as Hualapai Dam. Yeah. And we caught so much hell, uh, the electricity to pump the water out of the river to go to Phoenix and Tucson and let them grow was going to come from these huge dams. And the Sierra Club and other conservation groups started a big flap, and this was, uh, many people think, the turning point in the conservation movement fight to preserve some of the Western things and uh, forcing people to take a different look. Mm -hmm. They hoped that the mechanics and the economics of of uh, large reclamation projects. But we cut so much hell that it was pretty clear we weren't going to have Central Arizona project. And so we decided not to build the dams and to build a big uh, coal-fired power plant at Page, which is there today, to provide the pumping power. But every year or so, these people would come back and they'd want to get going on these dams again. And it was my fear that uh, we were going to torpedo the whole project if we didn't stick the other way. And so Barry and I, he came over to see me, and uh, we went together on an amendment to one of those bills which said we're not going to build Bridge Canyon Dam and we're not going to build a Wallapai Dam. I think we're right, although there are a lot of people in Arizona who every year... They're still after Still it. after it. Yeah. And the Wallapai Indians want it, obviously, oh, because God, yes. they make a bundle. And that was the time that they were going to... They, because those dams were going to flood the Grand Canyon, too, as I recall. That's right. They were oh, yeah. a 300-foot dam in a mile-deep canyon. Yeah. And that was going to flood. Well, don't get started on that. that <laughs> we, we had a hell of a time with that, but uh, thanks to Johnny Rhodes down here and Mo up here and old Carl Hayden and Mac, the few governors we've had, we also had a one-eyed governor. That's right. Yeah, we're doing pretty good. Old, he's, talking about, he's talking about old Jack Williams, who was governor for eight years and lost an eye. I've got a story I remember. I was running for Congress the first time, and they invited me out to the Rotary or Kiwanis Club. And Jack Williams was there, and I'd known him a long time. The family known him, and he was just running for governor. It was the first time he ran. And uh, he was there, and Ted Riggins or somebody, a mutual friend, wanted me to come down and address the Rotary Club in Phoenix off Central Avenue. And I said as I began my speech, uh, I just want to say, my friends, I don't, hope I don't hurt any feelings, that I think it's a hell of a note when a major political party like the Republican Party nominates a man for high office, like governor who's only got one eye. <laughs> and everybody laughed. They knew me and they knew Jack, but they had a new reporter from the Arizona Republic who just knew in Arizona, and he ran back and phoned the city room that I had made a personal attack upon Jack Williams for, <laughs> for only having one good eye. Was that the time when the uh, Jack's opponent got very upset with one of the television stations because they were going to play the movie One-Eyed Jack and he was getting all kinds of extra publicity? <laughs> well, we've just about to run out of time here, gentlemen. I, I know that the group uh, here has enjoyed this very much, and so have I. I think that uh, we need to do more of these sort of things. Let the two of you and others who have known so much about Arizona and our history have a chance to visit about it. I wanted to, to just raise one question with the fact that there's been an awful lot of conversation about uh, what's going to be happening in 1988, and I wondered if either one of you have given any thought about uh, another run for the presidency? Oh, I've, I've been trying to get a recount. I, <laughs> well, I, I think... I, in all these years, I run into one guy. He was a taxi driver in New York City. He said, "You SOB, I didn't vote for you, but all the rest of them." I said, "I'm going to get a recount." 
I wish Mo would run. I might even come over and manage his campaign. Here, here. I'm available if there's an honest draft, and it seems like one is building up here. I, I couldn't turn down the voters, the taxpayers of this great country, if they insisted that I run. That's right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Good night. What, isn't there food over there? Yes. <laughs>